Hello, top of the evening to you. Today we're going to talk about sensation and perception, part one. We're going to learn about some basic principles. Let us begin. The first thing is, what is sensation? So, sensation is when we get our, receive the information from the world around us. So, we receive light coming into our eyes. We receive the air hitting our skin. We receive the sound of my voice right now going to your ears. You receive all these different uh, things from your environment, right? So the sensation is those receiving those signals from the environment, all right? That's, so this comes from the environment. This is like the raw data. So it's, I kind of think of sensation as the raw data. Um, it's the stuff that we're given. Perception is how we interpret that data, how we make sense of it. So perception is, what is that light that's hitting my eyeball right now? How is How am I interpreting that? How am I perceiving that light? Uh, and then we get more advanced into it. Is it. Am I perceiving enough of a signal from that light in order to pay attention to it? Is that voice that I'm hearing uh, enough for me to pay attention to it and it directs our attention. Um, so perception is how we interpret interpret that those signals that you're receiving. So they work together. Sensation is what you're getting. Perception is how you interpret it, how you make sense of it. Now <clears throat> we kind of interpret things in two generalized ways either bottom-up processing or top-down processing. So bottom-up processing is when we take the little pieces of data, we put them together, and we come up with something. So, for instance, in this picture, we take the, you know, the, the lines here. We say, okay, here's some tree roots. Okay, here's some rocks here. Oh, I see a horse. I see some trees. And you kind of put it all together. Oh, these are, this is some horse. This is a uh, cowboy in the... So the woods, and he's going through, you know, looking for something. All right. So you take the pieces of the of the scene, and you put it together, and you come up with an idea, or something of that nature. Top-down processing is when we use our uh, previous experiences or expectations to help us interpret something. So in this case, I human beings generally have a lot of experience with faces, right? We, we just talked about this in the developmental chapter. We like faces. Babies are really interested in looking at faces more than anything else, right? We like faces. And so we immediately we see face here, face here, face here, face here, face here. You kind of see a mouth here. If you count that as a nose, you see a nose here. And so you've got these different faces. You think, actually, I never noticed this one. This thing right here is a face too, right? And that branch, can you guys see that? Look at that. Oops, I don't know what I just did, but. That little face looking off to the side, his eyes are kind of looking like that. Anyhow, so I'm using my, my, my previous ideas experiences to see that. Another example of bottom-up and top-down processing, um, you want to drive, go to the local Walmart. If you've never been to the town before, you're going to have to get directions. You're going to have to get the street by street directions to get there, right? And then you're finally going to make your way there. You're going to have to go step by step by step. Now, if you live in the town and you say, oh, Walmart's over here, you're generally going to, you can generally start making your way that way, and you're generally going to find it because you have the previous experiences to do that, okay? Um, we talk about selective attention. We, it's what we're paying attention to. We generally have, and we take in, you know, some estimates, 11 million pieces of information every second, right? We generally look at about 40 of those things or pay attention to about 40 of those things every second, okay? So that's a lot of stuff not to pay attention to. So this whole idea of your brain and your mind and you paying attention to different things comes down to, you know, how much are you going to pay attention to? 
So our attention is selective. We don't pay attention to everything, right? And your parents um, are very aware of this when you don't pay attention to them. So we uh, experience this selective attention. <clears throat> now, there's some types of selective attention. One's called inattentional blindness. Now, this is where we don't pay attention to something that's in plain sight. So it's got to be in plain sight or plain, yeah, plain sight, I guess, or plain view, plain sound. It's got to be around. It's got to be evident, apparent. All right. Um, and we miss it because we're paying attention to something else. So talking on the cell phone is an example of inattentional blindness, right? We're paying attention to the person on the phone, thinking about what they're talking about, thinking about what they're saying, and we miss this car right here that's cutting in front of us and we crash, right? Or we don't see the person crossing the street, right? This is why cell phones are illegal in a lot of places around uh, the world now while you're driving, to be talking with them like that because you're not paying attention. You could have this thing called inattentional blindness where you're, because your attention is selective like we just saw, Right? You have this selective attention. You can easily have inattentional blindness where you don't pay attention to something because you're paying attention to something else more. Right? You're watching television and your mom and dad say, hey, I need you to help me out here. And you don't pay attention to this you're really in to who just got kicked off The Bachelor. And uh, so you're not listening to what your parents have to say. You might hear a voice. You might know what gender the voice is. You might know how loud the voice is. You pay attention to those kind of overall ideas, those meanings, those semantic encoding, but you're not going to know uh, what they said. Change blindness occurs when we don't notice a change in our environment. Classic example of change blindness um, that your teacher will probably show you in class. Two people are asking for directions. <clears throat> I'm sorry, one person asking, two people are talking, one person is asking for directions, then somebody else, you know, this guy will walk by he has this really big board and he'll kind of rudely cut in between these guys. All right, and as he's walking through, this guy right here will switch spots with this guy as they're, as they're walking through. So he's gonna walk down, he's gonna switch spots with this big board that's in the way, and then he's gonna continue, this guy right here is gonna continue talking to the guy and asking for directions. A, a good percentage of the time, the guy who was giving directions doesn't realize that there's somebody new that he's talking to now. That's change blindness. We don't realize that there's a change in our environment around us. We do this all the time. Watching movies, you know, there's like, uh, you they something might have changed in the movie. They might have made a mistake. We don't notice it because we're not paying attention, right? We, we have this change blindness. Another thing for selective attention is something called the cocktail party effect. Uh, it's called the cocktail party effect because in cocktail parties, right, there's lots of people all talking all at once. Right, they're all talking, they all think they've got the best thing in the world to talk about. And you are, here's you, you're just paying attention to this person right here, right? You find them mildly attractive, so you're paying attention to them. And all these other people who are talking, you're getting all this other sensory information into your ears, these lights, you know, all these different things, smells, but you're paying attention to this person because you find them attractive, right? Um, that's called that's known as the cocktail party effect. If somebody else happened to mention your name, right, you real quick would uh, direct your attention perhaps to that, right? You decide really quickly in your brain, am I going to uh, put my attention to that? So you, you, you'll be able to pick out your name pretty much. Um, but you still might block everything else out and just pay attention to the one thing. All right, so thresholds. Now, so we have all these different things, right? We have this attention, but... How do we, when do we pay attention to this stuff? This, this is where thresholds come in. You have this thing called absolute threshold. This is where you can detect a signal 50% of the time, all right? So if I could detect something 50% of the time, this is the scientific definition, you reach your absolute threshold. So for instance, you may have an alarm going off on your phone, right? And the alarm going off on your phone, right, is going off right here. And you start off way over here, right? And you don't hear it. But as you get closer and closer, and right here, maybe you do hear it, right? And so this distance right here, this distance from here to here, this is your absolute threshold to hear that alarm on your phone. You have to be at least this close in order to hear that. Okay, so that would be the absolute threshold. What is 
and you're going to be able to hear that 50% of the time. Sometimes you might walk by and you might not hear it right there. So other times you might, other times also, since it's only 50%, you might actually hear it over here, not all the time. So where's the spot where you hear it 50% of the time? That's your absolute threshold. Where's the spot where I'm going to see the light 50% of the time, right? So on the horizon, where am I going to see that light? Um, signal detection theory. Actually, I don't want to go over that because I don't have time. So let's go over subliminal. Subliminal talks about where we um, do we process information or is there information that's underneath that absolute threshold, right? So stuff that we don't pay attention to, that we're not paying attention to, right? There's a lot of, uh, you know, misinformation about advertisers and whatnot trying to influence us subliminally. Well, research shows that none of this works, right? Uh, flashing something on the movies, eat popcorn or drink Coke. Um, this actually hasn't really been done in, in real life, although there's, you know, people who say that it has in, in movie theaters and whatnot, but um, that doesn't work. It doesn't influence you that way. However, um, a type of subliminal information that may be subliminal uh, priming. Um, so subliminal actually, you know, 50, your absolute threshold says that you would detect it 50% of the time, right? So you may be, if that, remember we, we put that wall right here, you may detect it back here, right? That's, that would be under the 50% of the time. So I guess subliminal could be true in, you know, using the strict definition that we've come up with. However, priming, if you flash something and take it away and maybe change the image, um, that can prime you. Prime you means kind of get your brain thinking about something. So, for instance, uh, there's been studies where they'll flash like something nice, like uh, an animal, a nice little puppy or a kitten, and then they'll show a face. So they'll flash the cat, right? Uh, not cat. They'll flash the puppy. That sounds nicer. So they'll put the little puppy, they'll flash that on the screen. And then they'll show a picture of somebody's face and ask them, hey, how attractive are these people? And then they might show you a picture of, um, let's do this. Then they might show you a picture of something gross, like a, a rotting bird or something, you know. So you got this dead bird right here. And they're going to show you that same face. And ask you how attractive you find it. You know, the people who saw the nice little puppy are going to find this thing more attractive because they've been primed by this cute little thing uh, that they've seen. <clears throat> That's one example of priming. So priming occurs when it kind of gets your brain thinking in a certain direction. Another example of priming, if I showed you a picture of, I think uh, we did this in a previous video, but you know, I showed you a picture of, yeah, this is a pretty good little rabbit right here. Look at that. There's a little tail right there. Kind of rabbit noses look like this. Look at that. Oh yeah. Oh, I don't know what that is. There's a smile though. <clears throat> so the the rabbit, you show a picture of a rabbit, you know, you take that off the screen, and then you ask you ask somebody, hey, spell hair for me. Right? And the people who saw the rabbit are gonna spell it like this. Because that's the way you spell rabbit hair, right? They were primed for it. Okay, three more things to talk about. One's called difference threshold, or it's also known as the just noticeable. Did I spell that right? Difference. The J and D. This is <clears throat> what difference am I going to need to detect a difference in changes of a sensation? So. How much do I have to turn the light down before you're going to notice that I changed the light? Or how much am I going to have to turn the volume up on the television before you notice it, right? If you have that volume really loud and you turn it up one, or somebody's going to notice it. So that level that you're going to need to reach <clears throat> in order to, for somebody to de detect that you've changed it, it's called the difference threshold or the just noticeable difference. And Weber's law talks about this and says that the just noticeable difference or the difference threshold is related more to the um, to the percentage, not the um, actual amount. So <clears throat> let me explain that. Imagine you know on your on your television screen, 
you know, you have those little bars that have the volume down here. You know, you got like a volume level of 12, right? Well, if I increase that by five, <clears throat> by five, and it's at a 12, so now it's at a 17, you might, I don't know if that's 17, you might notice that difference. However, if we're watching the Super Bowl, and I ha I'm starting out at 50, because I have this thing blasting, because I want everybody in my house to hear it, and then I raise it 5 at 50, you know, and I get to 55, <clears throat> there's a good chance that not everybody's going to see it, because the actual, the actual number stayed the same. We, we increased it 5 each time. However, the percentage was much different here. 50 to 55 is a much smaller percentage than 12 to 15. You guys follow me? So this percentage going up 5 from 50 to 55 is a small percentage compared to going up from 12 to 17. This is a much bigger percentage. So Weber would say the percentage is what really matters, not the actual amount. <clears throat> and then finally, sensory adaptation. Um, this, this refers to the idea that we adapt to our senses. So you walk, then we adapt to yeah, what, we're, what we're experiencing. So a perfect example, um, <clears throat> during my prep period in my class, I have a freshman class right after lunch who, who's in there. And this freshman class smells like freshmen. You've smelt them before, right? Not, not you, of course, if you're a freshman. Those other people. Um, <clears throat> so it smells, it smells bad in there. It's right after lunch. People are kind of sweaty. It's gross. And so right when I walk in there, you know, you can smell it right away. But nobody in that room is like, oh, this place stinks. The teacher who's teaching in my room doesn't think it smells. Nobody thinks it smells. I walk, when I walk in there, however, though, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's fresh. Let's open some doors to get some air in here. Um, after like three minutes, though, you know, a few minutes, nobody no would notice. I don't notice the smell anymore. No, it's because we've adapted our, <clears throat> we've adapted to our, our senses to this environment that we're in. All right, so we've got a lot of vocabulary terms here. That's it. I'm going to end it now so that it won't go any longer.